Assumptions can be deadly. You assume the rope bridge can handle your weight. You assume no alligators are swimming in this pond you're going to dive into. You assume the only Arconia character strong enough to break open a locked door would be Theo, Will, Kreps, Ivan the Waiter, maybe Zaz. You assume that someone breaking into Charles's apartment with a knife and going into the secret passageway is Bunny's killer. You assume that after episode 8, I'd change my top three suspects from Howard, Marv, and Lucy to other characters. But for the next 30 minutes, let's not assume any of those things, because I assume none of those assumptions are true. Let's solve Only Murders in the Building, Season 2, Episode 8, Hello Darkness. We'll be breaking down each episode for clues, suspects, and red glitter on our hunt to learn who killed Bunny Folger. In this podcast, we'll be reviewing a new theory floating around the interwebs about cake. Double M will have his musical analysis. We'll look at all the suspects. I'll have a mini rant about motives, more great feedback. And finally, we'll go over the results of our poll on who killed Bunny. Spoilers for the first season of Only Murders in the Building and the first eight episodes of the second season. If you haven't watched all 18 episodes, shut up. That's our slogan. Let's begin with the double C, the credit clues, and the opening Easter egg. Blackout across the city, and there is a cop car out front. Kreps. In the closing credits, we see this chicken, which was on the backpack of Glitter Guy, a.k.a. Detective Krebs, that Mabel grabbed last week. People are wondering about this logo. Is it a Chickasha backpack? a.k.a. related to Cindy Canning's podcast, All It's Not Okay in Oklahoma. On the other side of the credits, you'll see Nina in a puzzle piece. Before we get to news this week, I don't say it enough, but we at Double PHQ, we normally do after-show podcasts, and I started this Let's Solve series as a lark. I love comedy murder mysteries. I thought Only Murders in the Building is going to be fun. Maybe I could do this type of podcast because it's the type of podcast I'd like to see on YouTube, the one I'd like to hear on iTunes. And so I thought it'd be a fun way to talk about what I assumed was going to be a fun show. And your responses and theories and support, they mean so much to me. You know that Psychological 101, speaking about dads all season, my dad was a salesman. I hate having to do sales like, ooh, hit like, give comments, but I have to. And you guys have been so kind giving likes to these videos and comments to these videos. It's truly made this a wonderful experience. And your responses, your theories, your support, it's just made this whole thing fun. They keep me going as I work on this podcast rather than my actual job. You listeners, you people who give the feedback, you're the best. And when I say in the podcast, you know, I've never really considered Will as a suspect. I love to say, who cares what I think? If you think Will should be a suspect, you tell me loud and clear and Will will be in the suspect list. So thank you guys so much. We've got two more episodes coming up. They're going to be great. Last week's questions for everybody was, what is the ship name for Mabel and Theo? Damien wrote, Mabel plus Theo equals Feeble, which is also what O2WC thought, because poor Mabel, when she starts zoning out, she becomes a bit feeble. Feeble. Now, of course, Yusuf said Mabel and Theo should be Mabelo. Oh, so good. Sienna said Fable as a ship name. Max wrote, has anyone suggested Table? That's because their relationship is on the surface. Oh, Max, great. Jenny B said she was for Mayo. And Anna Marie said, Mayo, (laughs) no. And then finally, Joel gave us this ship name for Mabel and Theo. And he went with Theodore as Theo's full name. So he said the obvious ship name is Mabeldore. Love it. You guys are the best. Also in news this week, I think we do have to talk about cake theory. Cake theory, you're asking? Well, let's get to it. We've had an awful lot of feedback talking about the matchbook with the fingerprint, the pickle diner matchbook with the fingerprint. And here's a perfect example of some of that feedback. Ronnie Ringo wrote, In episode 7, I rewatched the scene where Lucy sits in the catacombs and sees the apparent murderer. It looks like the person Lucy saw wore gloves. So there can't be fingerprints from that person on the matchbook, right? Well, let's look at that. Why is there a fingerprint? The attacker at Bunny's door wore gloves. 
The person in the catacombs wore gloves. The person in Mabel's apartment holding the knife appeared to be wearing gloves. So if the person is wearing gloves, why would there be a bloody fingerprint on the matchbook? That's where the cake theory comes in. Back in the third episode of season two, we see the podcast trio celebrating in the courtyard with a cake. And look, on that cake is a big red candle shaped like a gun. How does a candle get lit? Well, somebody normally strikes a match from a matchbook. Perhaps a matchbook they got at the Pickle Diner. And that isn't blood on the matchbook, but instead red wax they got on their finger, which then got on the matchbook, which they later dropped in the secret passage in Mabel's apartment. Who could have lit the candle on this cake? They'd have to be somebody in the courtyard, probably somebody who enjoyed the cake. So of those people, you'd be looking at Lester, Ursula, the Podcast 3, and the superfans. Does this cake theory explain the matchbook with the fingerprint? What do you guys think? If you're listening to this podcast on the audio platforms like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Audible, and such, I really need you not only to subscribe, but leave a written review. We haven't had a written review in 2022 on our audio podcast of this feed. And so please, 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 I need a written review. Do me a solid and give me that written review. On YouTube, you know what to do with that like button. Hit it like it's a piece of cake. Before we get to our suspects, let's look at the masked person, the person who broke into the door with a knife, came into Charles's apartment, went into the secret passageway, went down the ladder to the 12th floor, and then moved away. What do you think? Are these boots the same boots that got off the elevator on the night Bunny died? Note that the pants leg is low enough to where we can't tell, did this person have an ankle monitor on? Now this masked person, they broke into Charles's front door rather than sneak in via the passageway. They're not dressed in all black like the previous killers had been. Call me crazy, but what if this person isn't the killer? What if this is like Detective Kreps testing out a theory? Hmm. Could the killer have come from Charles's apartment, gone into the secret passageway, and gone down to Bunny's apartment, and then gone into Mabel's apartment to kill Bunny? What if that's what we're seeing and not actually somebody trying to kill Lucy? If that's what we're seeing, all of the suspects who appear to be cleared in this episode are no longer cleared. How clever is only murders in the building? In the first season, the bassoon cleaner slash sex toy was brilliant and so clever. What is our bassoon cleaner clever clue for season two? Is it the elevator that only goes to 11? Is it 14? Is it savage? What's our tricky clue? There are still a couple of shots from the trailers which have not appeared in any of the first eight episodes. There's this shot of the suspect board, which includes Miss Ndoko. Has she appeared in season two? I don't think so. Plus, there's a shot of Mabel on the phone which I think will be in episode 9. What clues are we missing? Let's look at what episode 8 taught us about our victim, Arconia board president, Bunny Folger. Bunny could be nice. She paid attention to Lester's kids and knew when their birthdays were. She wanted the Arconia taken care of. She would quiz Nina about the people who worked there and lived there. Let's jump back to the very first episode of season 1 of Only Murders in the Building. The very first time we see Bunny Folger, she's on the phone with someone, planning to meet them at a restaurant. She says she wants the four-top table by the window. Mention her name, they'll know her. Is Bunny going to the Pickle Diner this day? The show is focused on Bunny because she received a package meant for Tim Kono. Ursula is the building manager who oversees the delivery of these packages. Lester is probably the one who delivers them. Why were they going to Bunny, 12A, rather than Tim Kono? 6A. Is there a chance that Bunny wanted Tim Kono's packages? Did she lose money from him as a financial consultant? Did she not trust him because of things she witnessed going through the secret passageways? One person we know would have wanted to see what Tim Kono was getting is Teddy Demas. Rose Cooper. Remember her? She was a character on this show, possibly. We've never actually seen Rose Cooper, or have we? What is going on with the painting? Is it a part of this mystery or not? What do you guys think? Let's get to our suspects. Ivan the waiter is in the restaurant when the blackout hits, but does he have a reason to sneak out and go to the Arconia? 
Superfan Marv. Veronica wrote, My theory is, what if one of the killers is Marv? Marv turns out to be Lucy's new dad. He seems to want to be more involved this season. He physically fits the profile. I want to say that he's the new dad to Lucy, or he's Alice's dad. The clues point to them in my eyes. Well, we know one thing about Marv. He is an omit B for life. He's also obsessed with the 6th Avenue slasher, who had a great M.O. of targeting older women, or when he would target younger women, or men. The 6th Avenue slasher, not always working on the 6th Avenue. What a great M.O. Marv really misses his daughter. Once again, fatherhood, parents, children, big theme of the season. Let's compare the flashlight that Marv had when he fell on the stairwell with the flashlight the person who broke into Charles' apartment had. They seem the same. If Marv broke into Charles' apartment, why was he carrying a knife? And why was he wearing a mask? Marv watches Kreps and Mabel talk. Is Marv suspicious of Kreps or want to be aware of what the police are talking about? It seems unlikely that Marv could have gotten to the Arconia, climbed up all those stairs, switched clothes, broken into Charles's apartment, then gone down, then switched into a third outfit. But I do think we still need to keep Marv on our watch list. And Oliver, be careful when he comes to your apartment. Uma Heller wasn't in this episode, and it's almost suspicious that she wasn't. Where was Uma during the blackout? Why isn't she here? Howard Morris. And the first thing we want to talk about Howard is that we always thought Howard lived in apartment 3C. But in this episode, he actually lives in apartment 3D. Huh. Okay. Howard is totally crushing on hottie resident Jonathan. And Howard talks to Dr. Grover Stanley about it. Howard works as an assistant director of collections department at Central Manhattan Public Library. Howard says that he likes his life, which contradicts the note he wrote where he bemoans being lonely. Now, when Dr. Grover Stanley says there's more to life than cats, Howard gets snippy and says he won't tell Sevelyn about this blasphemy from Dr. Stanley. But it's important to note that Howard gives his cats his last name. It's Sevelyn Marie Morris. They're like his children, a theme of the season. Howard is trying to work up the nerve to talk to Jonathan, who shows up at his door. Shut up. That's our slogan. Brilliant. Howard is so funny. If he's not the killer, he needs to be in every episode. Howard just kills it. He's so funny. Jonathan sneezes because of cat hair. Are we supposed to assume, as I've mentioned before, that the person in the passageway sneezed because Howard and or his cats had been in the secret passageway? Lester, let's give it up for him. He loves his job and he liked Bunny. He has two kids, May and Frank. One's in college and one's in big trouble. They're in improv. Lester is really depressed because he thinks he may have let the killer into the building that night. Jonathan, who lives in apartment 3A, he showed up last week on the Who Killed Bunny website and people were like, who the hell is Jonathan? Well, now we know. He needs batteries for his flashlight. He stars as a hyena in The Lion King. He always wanted to be a librarian. He loves singing just like Howard does. Jonathan sneezes like the person in the passageway did. Jonathan shows up and he's out of like a dream for Howard. Is that real? Is this whimsy of the show? Or is he like an undercover cop trying to ingratiate himself in the Arconia life so he can learn who the killer is? New board president Nina Lin. Nina still seems to have a plan for construction on the top floor until after she talks to Lester and may be having a change of heart. Dr. Grover Stanley, always working. Ursula, gut milk. Ursula, you know, let's not even talk about her in this episode just yet. Let's go back to season one, episode two. In Ursula's office is a picture of the Wonder Wheel from Coney Island. Hmm. Tracy wrote, the engagement ring in season one was delivered to Bunny's place by accident. Ursula's accident. Let's also point out that Ursula stabs quite violently into her box of gut milk. Teddy Demas. Now this iPhone theory just won't go away. Jay wrote, did Teddy call Theo via FaceTime? If so, does that mean the Demases have iPhones and therefore can be ruled out as suspects? Hmm. Theo Demas wasn't in this episode, but he would be strong enough to burst open a locked door. He also has the right frame to be the person with the knife. Oliver's son, Will, also would be strong enough to burst open a locked door and has the right frame to be the person with the knife. Alice Banks and the painting, what is going on? Are they a part of this story, yes or no? Now, Lucy, in her text message, seems to have an iPhone as well. 
For people who don't want to be suspicious of Lucy, look at the poster in Cindy's office in Season 2, Episode 6, Knife Girl, the Story of a Child Martyr. Knife Girl. Is Lucy the Knife Girl? Now, Lucy in this episode is chased by the masked man into the passageway. Lucy really knows her way around the passageway. She leads the Podcast 3 out of the secret passageway. Detective Kreps has a picture of her and Charles. Was the detective looking at Charles as a suspect, or was the detective looking at Lucy as a suspect? Detective Kreps, or as we should call him, Glitter Guy. Glitter Guy, as we just mentioned, has a photo of Charles and Lucy. Is that because he wants to silence them, or because he suspects them as a cop? If Kreps really is Glitter Guy, then he sent the text message for the podcast trio to get out of the building. How did Detective Krebs know what was happening with Bunny and that the police were coming to the building to go to Mabel's apartment? The big three. Oliver has new knees, while Charles, back in 06, had his knees done. Getting old sounds terrible, everybody. I want to keep the knees I have. Let's not get older. Oh my goodness. Mabel has discovered Krebs' secret. Should she be watching her back? Before we get to your feedback, I'm going to have a mini rant. And if you know me, I generally love everything about this show, so having a rant feels weird. But let's talk about it. And it's complete hearsay, so hopefully this rant isn't too ranty and doesn't go anywhere too strong. On Reddit, someone claims to have seen the screener of all the season two episodes, aka they've seen through episode 10 and know who the killer is. This person on Reddit says that if you look at Reddit, you will see some people who've guessed the killer correctly, but not the killer's motive. Come on. If this is true, come on. That's exactly the problem with season one. Many people in our YouTube comments guessed Jan as the killer. They figured it out. They looked at the clues, they looked at the suspects, and they picked Jan. And that's great. But not a single person in our YouTube comments, or even in Reddit when I looked there, correctly guessed Jan's motive. And they couldn't because there weren't really clues. And I mock this in my podcast on episode 10 of season one. And so now this person saying that nobody can correctly guess the motive show I love you. I love only murders in the building. How in the world can you tell your audience to figure out the why and the why now if there aren't clues? Now, I want this to be a tricky mystery. I don't want everybody to solve it. But if you're telling me nobody can figure out the why and the why now, come on, Only Murders in the Building. You're so perfect at almost everything. Please, for season two, be perfect for this as well. And that's the end of my mini rant. Hopefully it wasn't too ranty. Now let's get to your feedback. I got an email, and you can email us hello at doublepmedia.com. That's hello at doublepmedia.com. I got this email from Gabby, who said, does Zoe's family even still live in the Arconia? Gabby, that's a great question. Her family took up the entire 11th floor. Gabby also asked, and where the heck is Mabel's aunt? Well, if we don't see her this season, she's got to show up next season, right, Gabby? Another email came in from Jeff, and it's a bit long. I'll try to touch on the major points. Jeff has a theory, which goes, Detective Kreps has been investigating the Demas crime family for years. He recruited Bunny to intercept Tim's packages so they could be searched and cataloged in an attempt to decide if Tim was involved in the Demas crime family or not. Detective Kreps doesn't want this podcast trio messing up his investigation into the Demas crime family, so he leaves a note to Oliver to stop the podcast. Now that is some smart detective work by Jeff, and that does explain some of the things from season one, like why wasn't this toxology report on Tim Kono followed up on? Because it was bumping up a bigger investigation. Now is that bigger investigation the Demas crime family or something else? I'm not sure, but I love that part of Jeff's theory. I should also say on Instagram, Sasha sent her murder board with all her clues, and uh, if you guys saw this thing, it was incredible. On Twitter, Emmy wrote, As the season keeps going, episodes keep getting further and further away from the painting piece. As another user pointed out, the why for me has to be the painting. Somebody killed Bunny at that specific moment for the painting. But who? Also on Twitter, SK wrote, Love your theory about Lucy. Think about it. An innocent-looking one who's been sticking around the trio the whole time turns out to be the killer, just like Jan. Oh, so good. Based on a question last week I asked you guys, there was a bit of a debate in the feedback about which was the better season. The Revolution said season one was superior. 
while Stewie, S-T-U-W-I, wrote, I don't have any guesses for the killer in season two, and honestly, it's a bit of a problem with the season, in my opinion. It doesn't function like a classic mystery. There are no suspects at all, according to Stewie. Bobby wrote, season two is better, but it's unfair to compare because season one had to form the relationship between the three protagonists. Season two, on the other hand, has total freedom. Jackie wrote, I have to say, I do not like how slow season two is. We still don't know the DNA results that Oliver had to find out if Will is his son. Plus, Jackie didn't like last week Glitter Guy went to a locker room and didn't take off his mask when he thought he was alone in the locker room, for heaven's sake. Jenny wrote, season two is better. I don't know if it's the way she was playing the character, but Selena is showing more emotional range this season, and she's a main character that makes it more enjoyable to watch. Emily also agrees with season two being better. Emily wrote, I think this season's better than the last one. Sharper writing, better jokes, and more creativity with the dynamic scenes, like Oliver's 1970s theme montage in the Son of Sam game. Still think it can lean into soap opera-ish tropes too hard once in a while. Ooh, love your feedback. Here's some more great feedback that is on this year's mystery. Dahlia wrote, I believe that Alice may be the next to die because in her art exhibit, she is dressed like Mabel, just like Bunny was dressed like Mabel in a tie-dye hoodie sweatshirt. I'd also like to point out that the picture of Lucy and Charles is folded in half, similar to the way Alice's Son of Sam card was folded in half coincidence? I think not. Kristen Marie wrote, my biggest question is who called 911 and reported Bunny's attack? And more importantly, what did the caller say? Well, Kristen, the cops certainly have to have that recording. Queen B wrote, I think the person who killed Bunny and the person in Mabel's apartment are two different people. I think Bunny was killed over the painting and that someone else is after Mabel. I think that the dream that Mabel keeps having of someone standing over her with her stabbing them with knitting needles is a repressed memory. I also think Bunny's last words were her trying to tell Mabel that Charles is in danger. Lauren agrees with Queen Bee where she says, I'm starting to think that the fantasy Mabel has at the beginning of season one where she stabs the intruder with her knitting needles might be a true memory that she has suppressed. Perhaps it actually happened in the past and she's in denial. And finally, Gail Elliott wrote, and I love this, I had a dream last night that it's Teddy Demas. Ooh, solving crimes via a dream. For the few of you who've been following Double PHQ all this time, know that we started by covering a lot of Game of Thrones, but also Twin Peaks, a really fun show, at least in season one and season two, in my opinion. Gail goes on to write, who knows, maybe Teddy was facing eviction after season one. Teddy has a motive to get back at the podcast trio. And I'm wondering if he'll end up dead at Theo's hands. Ooh. Gail says she thinks Alice is a red herring. Oh, man, such great feedback. Wonderful feedback. Let's get to Double M with his talk about the music in recent episodes of Only Murders in the Building. Hey everybody, Matt here. Hope that your exploration into this mystery is going well and that all of the clues that you're finding is confirming your suspicions. I had some suspicions about the music in episode 6, but most of them were delightful suspicions. For instance, I loved the guitar at the beginning of the episode. Now, as it turns out, that piece of music actually was in the soundtrack from last year, released in 2021, called all is not okay. But the guitar is used so little in this show that it's always surprising to hear it. Another thing that I found interesting was the sequence of planting the paint bomb, well, the glitter bomb, in the park. As Oliver's putting it in there, we hear some music that sounds like this. You remember earlier in the season, I pointed out how sometimes Siddhartha will shift the rhythm so that it's not straight triplet feels like the da-da-da-da-da-da, and he'll change those into straight eights so you get two phrases of three and then a phrase of two. What that does is that helps create a greater sense of anticipation because it feels like one beat is falling off as compared to what we're used to hearing. Additionally, he added a neat melody on top, as you heard, That is an allusion to the main theme, but he also added a weird chord in the middle of it. And he used this weird chord in order to create more anticipation 
And as our heroes are setting their trap, will it work? Who will show up? The second chord in there is actually what we call a two major. Don't worry about the numbers. The number two doesn't matter. It's just the second step in the key. But normally in a minor key, as this is in, that two chord would be either minor or diminished. But here it becomes major. And it doesn't really flow all that much with the minor chord. When you do the transition, it's a little awkward. And this situation is a little awkward, especially when you consider Oliver trying to put it in. But I don't think that was his intent. I think his intent was to make you anticipate what's going to happen next even more. A really funny thing that he did in that same setting a little bit later was that he kept the sentimental music going as Charlie was telling his story, even as the glitter stuff was happening behind them and they didn't notice. It was a perfect stroke because if he'd have suddenly done something weird with the music, it would have pulled your attention away and you would have thought psychologically, well, the characters should be pulled away from the moment with Charles. But they're so into him, so he kept the music into him. A great approach. And it made what was happening even more funny. Man, I love the Theo episodes. They're so good. And Selena Gomez was so good in this episode also. Everything was just fantastic about this entire episode, including the ending, where we got what we call an augmented one chord. And again, the numbers aren't important. But what happens is that the sixth note of the key becomes indicative of the minor while the root remains major. So minor tends to add a darkness to a sound and major tends to add a happiness to a sound. And when you couple that with the images of young Mabel with her father and the fact that she realized that she didn't black out and kill Bunny, the use of that flat six in the major chord is what gives it the wonderful feeling of resolution. No distance between notes offers a better resolution than a half step. And that's what happens here. It's this note that doesn't fit, but because it resolves, we get a sense of relief or happiness. And that's all I've got this week. Take care. To end the podcast, let's look at the current results in our Who Do You Think Killed Bunny poll on our YouTube community page. This has over 440 votes, and there were four options plus an other option. And currently in the lead with 41% is other. There are a whole mess of answers as to who the other is, but 41% of you don't think it's one of the four people in the choices. And let's talk about those choices. Alice was the first choice. Alice only got 10% of the vote. Ivan, the waiter, also only got 10% of the vote. A few more people voted for Lucy, who got 16% of the Who Do You Think Killed Bunny vote. The number one answer, admittedly with only 22%, is Howard. Maybe that's confirmation bias. Maybe you've listened to me too long saying I think it's Howard. But currently, Howard is in the poll position with 22%. As I mentioned, the real leader is the other option. So who is the leading vote getter of the other, where people had to write down in the comments who they think the killer is? The leader of the other pack is Marv followed by Detective Kreps, Will, and then we got a handful of people who vote for things like Oscar, Theo, Poppy, Cinda, Nina's baby daddy, Jared. We had Mrs. Gambolini get a vote. We had Lucy's dad get a vote, as well as Charles's father get a vote. Those are a lot of suspects. What do you guys think? We've got two episodes left. That means we need all your comments, all your likes. We need to solve it. Guys, we got two weeks to solve Who Killed Bunny. Talk to you next week.